black 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 What is up, everybody? My name is James DeFiori, and this is Blackballed. Um, as a writer, I have had a million jobs, which is hilarious because all of my exes say that I was always unemployed, but I, I had a million jobs. I just couldn't hold them. And one time I was at a mall in Mississauga. I think I was like selling like photography packages in one of those makeshift kiosks or something. It was a horrible job. I hated it. And... I saw this crowd, a small crowd, kind of brewing, maybe like 50 feet away. And, you know, because I was not a good worker, I just wandered away from my station and decided to go see what this crowd was all about. And beside the uh, lottery till, you know, those lottery till kiosks in the middle of a mall, I saw uh, the man who was causing this stir. And there were people around him and he took time to like talk to them and shook their hands and took pictures and all that kind of stuff. And that man was George Chevallo. And I, 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 was, I was taken aback at, 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 you know, at not just the way that he was generous with his time, but the way he seemed to impact the people that were asking for his autograph or just wanted to like say hi to him. And one girl that I remember in particular was in tears. And she hugged him and, and expressed her condolences at all the tragedies that this man went through. And when I was contacted the other day by an individual who said, hey, do you want to have uh, myself and George's son on to the show? I, I was like, yes, of course. And so I would like to welcome to Blackballed, Mitch Chevallo and Tom Doyle. Gentlemen, how are you today? I'm good. How are you guys? We're doing well. Good, good, good. Tommy, James, thanks for having us on. Nice, always nice to be it's on my with Tom. Tommy Doyle. I'd love to be on with Tommy Doyle. Lots of stories. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad that Tom's on too because you have still a pretty decent head of hair, and Tom and I now have the advantage in the in the in, in the game of the game of domes, I guess we'll call well, it. Uh, they, they they say that uh, um, less hair, more testosterone. So you guys are the manly types. That's like right. It, right, it, Tom? It, what, Mitch, what does George call me in Croatian? Oh, uh, Veliki Cello, Big Baldy. Yeah, <laughs> Cello, wow. Cello. Yeah. Well, what, I'm 5'6", so what is medium Baldy? Yeah, like, I, like, I, <laughs> I wish I spoke better Croatian. I don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, listen, I, uh, before we get started, I just want to play a quick clip because, uh, as I mentioned to you in the green room, one of my favorite aspects of your dad was uh, listening to Muhammad Ali talk about him because he's such a legend. And, um, and I just think that I'm not sure if, if, if people really understand the respect that he had for him. So I'm going to play a quick, uh, a quick clip. And then when we come back, we, we can cover a whole bunch of stuff. So. Do you really think there is a chance that you could lose to Chevallo here? Well, as a matter of fact, I know I can lose to Chevallo or anybody. If it's a 15-round fight and after about 8 or 9 or 10, I poop out and can't go no farther, then there's nothing to do but to tie up and to hold and, you know, lose. It's easy to see that you're the loser. But well, Chevallo's being... ranked 9 or 10, and I think you once, once called him a washerwoman. Now, what can he do that worries you? Well, campaigning for the uh, title, uh, before I fought him, I was calling him the washerwoman and uh, many more names for other fighters. But I saw him, uh, I canceled the name after I saw him 
Pat Patterson to a 12 rugged round decision. Uh, he had Patterson out a few times. Patterson did nothing but hold and run. He couldn't master him. I saw Terrell hold and run for 15, and he's never been out or never been down, and it's nothing to underestimate. And all the controversy and the traveling and breaking camp, I'm not in the shape that I should be in, so I'm just looking for a good fight. I believe I win naturally, but I'm not popping off or predicting because I'm not that sure to, to be predicted. It's like, I don't know. It's like Michael Jordan giving your dad props for being a good basketball player or something like that. Um, is it, it, You're used to seeing stuff like that. And I'm just wondering if the, if the sort of magic of, of, of sort of hearing words from a legend like that has... Is your Muhammad Ali the greatest one to talk to about your old man like that? Oh, well, yeah, um, for sure. I mean, in retrospect, looking back in time, right? You're going to remember, uh, James, I went to that fight. I was six years old. Uh, and it's one of my sem seminal memories, I think you could say, in my life. I, I, when I think of things that will probably go through my head before I expire, you know, and, and that the yoga, the last minute, you know, it's all coming together. That's probably going to be in there somewhere, right? So, um, yeah, the, uh, magical time but you have to remember i wanted my dad to my i wanted my dad to give him a thorough thumping right so i <laughs> I, I had a, a, di a different psychological landscape there right than, than just being an admirer of muhammad of course once i found out later what a what a huge figure he was in the world of sport and, and life in general yeah I, I, you look back on it now and you go wow yeah I, and that was a very respectful piece you know, that was a very yeah. respectful piece yeah, I mean, he, he. I've seen a bunch of clips about uh, with Muhammad Ali. Just he, he seemed to have the utmost respect for for your dad. Like it's, you know, it didn't seem fake. And Muhammad Ali wasn't known as being like a boxer that would compliment the other boxers. Like he was known as like a smooth trash talker, wasn't he? For the most part. Yeah, I would say so. Yeah. Tommy, you got any opinions on Muhammad? No, Muhammad. Yeah, he's uh, he likes to trash talk. He talks a lot in the ring. Yeah, I, I mean, you, he, could, he could back it up too, right? So, um, yeah. but sorry, uh, go ahead. I interrupted you, James. Sorry. No, no, please, please continue. I uh, just, um, we're, we're talking about respect. You know, uh, Angelo Dundee, um, uh, Muhammad's trainer, uh, had made overtures at one time in George's career for George to go train with him down in Miami. So he, he knew of George's capabilities. And he, he said he whenever he, one of his fighters... He had uh, three or four fighters he trained to fight George. Whenever they got, were getting ready for my father, you know, they had to stay off the ropes. They had to be in fantastic shape. They had to be able to move and not stay stationary. So he, he had the greatest respect for my dad. And I think that shows uh, in Muhammad's words there, too. He, he took the fight seriously. Well, Angelo, uh, Dundee, Angelo Dundee actually said if he had George in his camp, George would be heavyweight champion of the world. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm, very kind. Um, you you mentioned off air, and I forgot about this. Although I did see it in the, in a documentary that I saw uh, of your father, was it 17 days notice that he had? He was like a last minute because someone got injured or something. Well, what what happened was um, Muhammad's draft status changed. It went from mm. one Y to one A, which made him eligible then for the draft, which he then was. And um, Muhammad was honest. He said, why are they, he says, I barely passed high school. He was dyslexic. I don't know if people knew that about Muhammad. He was dyslexic, like a lot of very creative people, right? So mm -hmm. um, uh, after his draft status changed, he was upset. It was also the time that um, he had uh, declared himself to be Muhammad Ali. Um, if I just can go back a, a step, Muhammad always respected yeah. George, although he never said this. It was because my dad was the first fighter to call him Ali, to call him Muhammad. My dad was the first one to publicly do so that. So the other fight, I, would, no the other fighters would call him Cassius Clay well, to get into his head, um, or yeah, I think so. I think so. Yeah, it was kind of like yeah, we. I mean, far for me to comment on the history of slave, uh, slavery in the United States, but that was his. That was his mm -hmm. quote unquote slave name, right? So. Um, yeah, yeah it's just not cool. But um, yeah, sometimes trash talking goes a little too far, <laughs> you know. 
No, 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 no. Muhammad could be, um, he could be cruel. Not his, not his trash talking. I mean, that kind of personal, uh, like I just watched the movie Hustle. It just reminded me of that. Um, the Adam Sandler movie about uh, Bo Cruz and him bringing him up. And then he, uh, they were at a tryout game and uh, he, the, one of the players saw Bo Cruz's daughter in the crowd and started really talking trash about his daughter. And his daughter was like seven. You know what I mean? Like there's certain trash talking that I think steps over a line. And I think that not calling a person by the name that they want to be called might be because especially because of all the historical significances, like you just mentioned, you know, like he wants to get rid of his slave name. He wants to be known as Muhammad Ali, you know, so call him Ali. Yeah. I think yeah. your dad made the right call. Yeah. My dad made the right call because my, my, my father always said he, he stood up to a lot of powerful people, right? He stood yeah. up to a lot of power and George respected that because in boxing, there are a lot of powerful people out there. Yeah, no, exactly. Um, you, growing up, when, when George was, uh, was, was sort of starting out in the first like uh, segment of his career, for lack of better words, it was a really blue-collar existence, wasn't it? Like, there wasn't, like, you guys were, it was tough living back then, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Um, I think my, my parents moved in with, with uh, my dad's parents, uh, my mom's in-laws, um, uh, immediately after. And then uh, George had a bit of a rough time. Um, he had to buy out his contract. He wasn't happy with the training he had. And he made a move to Detroit, uh, where we lived in a little one-room flat, uh, my my mother, my dad, of course, myself, and uh, um, my brother Stephen. So my mom was pregnant, and she she actually had my brother Georgie in Detroit. But I remember we had like you remember hot plates, guys. You guys yeah. remember what yeah. a hot plate looked like? Yeah, I remember. <laughs> I, I remember. I remember cooking on like one singular hot plate. And, and running up and down the hall, hallways, back and forth. And yeah, going with my dad across the street to like an abandoned acreage where my dad would run the perimeter, right? Always keeping an eye on me, you know, and I'd be playing with mm -hmm. whatever there was to play with in, the, in, the, <laughs> in one of the roughest parts of Detroit, you know, on Woodward Avenue. Yeah, so yeah, money was not always, always there. It, it started to improve uh, when my dad started fighting for the championship of the world. Money, money became... Uh, a livable wage for a guy with that many kids yeah and uh, tom when did you get into the picture and uh when we when we spoke before uh before the podcast uh like yesterday the day before you were um i, I mentioned to you that, you know what do i call you in my promo and then we decided right hand man what is that what did that entail for george uh, you must have the i always think that like there are certain people with certain positions in life that have the best stories the executive assistants of powerful men i knew one of a billionaire, she had the greatest stories. They were like the best stories ever. Some of them were like really crazy, but like they were interesting. So when did you come into the picture? What was your role like? And uh, and tell me a little bit about that. So, you know, I, I used to go down to Sully's gym. I'd see George there. Um, years later, I started meeting him at events and things like that. Uh, he took my number down one time and uh, next morning he calls me up. He says, hey chap, let's go for breakfast. We went for breakfast and uh, we hit it off just like that. Um, I started going, he called me for everything. I was going to all these events with him. I was traveling with him. Um, I've seen everything. I've met every boxer I've met. It's been great. Um, yeah, there's the tick, Mike Tyson. Um, it's yeah. funny because Mike Tyson was just here two years ago to see George. Uh, we had Lennox Lewis comes in to see George. Larry Holmes has been here to see George. Uh, Jerry Cooney's been here to see George in the last few years. Um, his right-hand man, George, didn't have a cell phone and never had a computer. <laughs> <laughs> I was always the one he'd say, "Champ, get that guy's number, or, or you know, give this, give the number to Tommy." And I did all like, I'd take all his calls all day, all night for him. He called you, Champ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. George called everybody, Champ. Champ, yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, that's great. Um, okay, so um, the process of, of of becoming a professional fighter. I know your dad like like kind of had like a a trainer issue, um, sort of like twenty matches into his professional career or something like that, and and there was a lot of like uh, trans transitional periods for him. I'm wondering um, when did maybe I should word it differently. 
Did his boxing career impact the family um, negatively or positively? And is that an even is that a f- even a fair question to ask? Like, I, I, I don't know how to word it because um, no, eventually no, we're going to trans. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, I, I, I think James is, you know, sure. Like, like it's causation, right? You're, you're, you're asking about causation, basically mm-hmm. what causes something to happen. Right. And, and I've thought about causation many times. And, uh, you know, um, sometimes it's a linear path with these things, and then sometimes it's, it's, it's wobbly. So would you say that, you know, growing up, uh, having to live up to the reputation of, you know, arguably the toughest man in the country is psychologically challenging? <laughs> yeah, yeah, a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. You know, my, my, brothers, my brothers had a harder time than I did with it. Uh, and yeah, for, for obvious reasons, but, um, I, I just think, you know, I've, I've seen so much of the, the good, the people like Tommy, as Tommy just talked about the people you meet, the warmth, the friendliness, the connection piece, uh, the opportunities to travel, to, uh, yeah, just to hear stories of like courage and, and, and hard work and, you know, just sometimes luck coming through yeah, all those stories that surround the boxing world. Uh, yeah, listen, I'm going to always tilt in favor of it that was better than worse because I loved it. You know? um, so maybe, maybe you should, I should stay there for a second. So everybody knows um, that, that, that knows your dad and that has read about him. Um, knows the tragedies that you've experienced. I, I kind of want to talk about that now and then move on to like more yeah, positive sure. stuff. But um, y- you, uh, like I, I have a hard time talking about this because I, I don't even know how to word it. But um, you've lost three siblings and your mom to overdoses and suicides. And it had, um, it seemed to for a while at least, prompted your dad to do a lot of altruistic um, charity work. Right. Um, and, and, and yourself, I'm told, as well. <sighs> Uh, I, guess I, easy, that, I guess the James, question I'm, that makes I'm, the mo- uh, let me just back yeah. you up because you made a point. Okay. This one. Was it altruistic? He got paid to do it. You know, he okay. still got paid to do it, right? He had to make he had to make a living. He had to make a living. What do ex fighters do? I mean, and that's one hell of a way to make a living, by the way. That's a hell yeah. of a way to make a living. But he had to make and and I just want to make it clear he, he got paid to do that. Okay. Okay, um, but d- did he enjoy that work? Like, was it something that he found therapeutic? James, I can, I can talk for a second. I, I traveled yeah. with George and some of these, along with Mitch has done it. But in the last years, I traveled with George all these schools, two, three a day, uh, six a week. Um, he liked to talk and tell his story. We, we, you know, even at events, we had people come up and say, you know, George, I was in jail with one of your sons. You know, I talk. I, I met you wherever we talked. You saved my life. We've I've had kids. Kids didn't even know who he was when we went to these schools to talk, and, and the gyms were packed with kids. Some of these kids didn't know who he was. Yeah. At the end of the at the end of his story, they were up crying, talking to him. And he had that impact. Like he had that kind of effect. It's impossible not to be touched by your family story. It's just yeah. impossible. So I, 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 I know my father's story has helped a lot of people, a lot of people. I mean, Tommy, Tommy and I were at some boxing event a few years back and a, a woman comes up to us and she shows us the inside of her forearm and it says Shivalo and it, with a cracked heart and, and then like a muscle running through it. So it was, wow. it was like when people are, people are yeah, tattooing themselves. On the middle. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. I mean, because it, and it's that. and it's surreal in a way too. Because I mean, uh, the, I mean, you obviously wish that he didn't have to do that work because you didn't. You know, the life circumstances is what drove him to that that type of work. And it's like, you know, um, did you ever have any issues with substances? Well, I remember I went to university like everybody else in the 1970s, you know. <laughs> so the weed so, wasn't that good back then, Mitch. No, no, no. no. <laughs> well, so they say. Um, yeah. yeah, I listen. I, I, I'll tell it just to anybody. Like I'm conflicted because smoking pot for me was, you know, a bit of a liberator. Now I hated I hated the effect of my lungs, so I, I quit. Yeah. Um, but I, just in terms of just you know, not having to be a tough guy and just relaxing and thinking about ideas and stuff. Yeah, I, listen, I, I partook and, and uh, you know, it was, 
uh, an illegal drug at the time. So yeah, I don't feel too good about that. But you know, I I did I did not have anything beyond that. No. I heard your dad say once, and I'm paraphrasing about how um, he felt um, he felt guilty that he felt that he had passed down something to your siblings um, that was like in his blood that uh, that put them on a path um, of sort of self destruction. And um, yeah, do you do you agree with that, or do you think that that was well, I, sort of? I, I like, know, I know, I know that's. Listen, my dad was a powerful guy, right? And with a powerful yeah. ego, like all great athletes are. And I think that in his own mind, he feels that if he had won the championship of the world, then the problems bestowed upon his kids for him not winning it in his own mind, right? I, um, if he would have won that championship, he thinks I think he thinks life would have been a lot better. And I think that's- Do you place, agree with that? Do I agree that he thinks that way? No, no. Do you agree that, that it would have been better? Because it could have been worse. Yeah, yeah, of course. Of course. It's a little yeah. unanswerable, right? It, it, right? Now, now, James, in retrospect, looking at what happened to my family, kind of tough to think it was going to be worse. But... True. Sorry, I didn't mean it. Uh, I should have no, no, checked I can, myself at that. No, but no, but no, it, I, no. I can laugh at it. I, it I'm good. Yeah. I'm good. <laughs> um, and, and right now, he... Um, uh, he like his, his mental state is pretty, pretty gone right now. Right. He's got dementia. Is that right? Yeah. He's got whatever type of dementia it is. It doesn't matter at this point. He's non-communicative. How, how would you, how would you describe him, Tom? How would you describe big George? Um, I don't, uh, it's hard to describe. Like I see him, he just lays there. He looks at you. You just stare straight in your eyes, but he doesn't know what's going on around. Him. Yeah. Yeah. He's just, yeah. He's opening his eyes, but I don't think he's cognitively, he's, he's like, must be a horrible thing to have dementia, right? Just everything slips away, right? So, and especially if you're... Before, before he, he was diagnosed with dementia, you know, I was bringing him to his doctor's appointments and I was listening to doctors, you know, saying he's had a hundred concussions and he didn't even know he had all those. Yeah. Throughout no, his life. No one, no one spoke about concussion at all in boxing. Exactly. Yeah, and, and that's obviously what funny. caused... He yeah, was just, we'd be driving along and this guy could a number in his head like he could calculate anything in his head it was so quick and yeah. his he, and his jokes and everything he would come back with one liners like so quick it was unbelievable yeah, yeah. um spider jones let's move on Let, let's pivot um and we'll come back to that by the way because um i i I, I have a recent experience with uh, family members that uh, that went through the same thing, but I want to come back to that because I want to get the Spider Jones thing out of the way. I got a message from Tom, and it says, um, and I didn't listen to the podcast because I hate Toronto Mike. I think he's an ass clown. <laughs> Sorry, but <laughs> I do. Tell us um, how you really feel. <laughs> I, I don't like him at all. Um, but well, he doesn't like my 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 colleague, and I would say my boss in a sense, Dean Blundell. Like they have a little feud. So as a loyalist. I don't like them. Um, but anyways, <laughs> but you guys are so that, tribal in this business. I don't know. <laughs> I, well, we're just so much better at what we do, and he doesn't think so. So it's weird. Um, but anyways, uh, <laughs> yeah. Mitch, along with the boxing world, called Spider Out on his lies of boxing. What, what are you guys talking about there? And 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 what was the controversy? Pretend none of us know anything. Well, Tommy, you start and go with this one because I've got very little to say. But go ahead, <laughs> Spider. Uh... Over the years, especially the last few years, when he knew George was losing his mind, and Muhammad Ali's not around anymore, Angelo Dundee's not around anymore, he was always using George's name. Uh, he said in 1966 he was at Sully's gym when Muhammad Ali was here to train for George's fight, and Muhammad picked him out of a crowd to spar with him. Spider wasn't even in Toronto in 1966. Um, uh. You know, and we have witnesses to it. Mitch, Mitch was around then. Mitch was young, but he was around then. We've talked to everyone at Sully's gym. We there was boxers, Nikki Ferlano, and guys like that. They were all around at that time. Spider says it was in the Sun paper, the Star paper. We've checked into that. It was never in that, even though we knew ourselves he was not there. We just went and looked at different things just to see out there, Spider. Um, but. So was he like trying to profit or trying to well, yeah. like get Listen, clout or something? He's he's got he's got a charity. 
believe to achieve. He says we're attacking it. We've never attacked the charity. We've attacked that he goes and tells these kids lies, and he gets paid to do this too. And he uses George's name. The whole reason Muhammad was here has nothing to do with Spider. Muhammad was here to fight George. That's a that, that's a big deal. There's a plaque plaque downtown on Ossington and Queen from the Heritage Toronto where Sully's gym used to be. And it's about George and Muhammad, not Spider Jones and his sparring, which never happened. But he's trying to take over this. Then he's telling people how he was a professional boxer. He was never. What was he? Mitch, like, what, what, what did he do? No, no, like, was, was he a uh, trainer? Like, what did he do? No, 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 no. The spider was, um, I don't know, a bit of a jack of all trades. I know he he, he went to, uh, eventually went to Seneca College or something, took some uh, radio and television communications course. And I know he's done a little bit of TV work. He did that kind of stuff. But he went ostensibly, he got his big break with my dad when my dad created a TV show called Famous Knockouts, where they would, uh, James, look back at fights from the, like, 30s, 40s, and 50s, old by very very mood and they get dressed up like gangsters and he chose spider to be his his uh co-host and it was on every saturday afternoon people still have it was a bit of a cult classic really Mm. in canadian uh tv terms but um uh spider you know took that and ran with it and he got some entertainment he he does did a little singing he was at at a bit of an act of the show he's been on radio a few times and now um um tommy's right he's involved with a charity and I, and I have I have issue with Spider uh, two two ways. First of all, uh, you asked if uh, you know my father not winning that championship of the world probably affected my family's life negatively, right? So uh, you you have to understand that's a pretty you know I, I could answer that at different times different ways, but so that's a pretty sacred territory for me, like mentally and psychologically. And I don't want anybody imposing themselves, parachuting in. I was there to look at me. No, 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 no. I, I wanted to, to be as pure and memorable and virtuous as I can remember it. And that's the way I'm going to do that. And if I have to stand up for that moment, if I have to do that, you know, it makes some people uncomfortable. That's too bad because I'm going to do that. That's number one. Yeah. N- n- number two, what hurts me about Spider is that that, story I told you earlier about my my dad giving him a huge break and I always thought that spider was you know uh, you know it's sometimes a little you know way too interested in self-promotion and just like relax a little bit buddy and um, you know I w- we thought of him as a family friend right so right. when when he does that knowing full well that my dad's in you know, demented state, Muhammad's gone, Angelo Dundee's gone, like, like this, you know, the, then the story started to increase and I started to see them all, th- all the time, especially with the passing of Muhammad. I just said, enough's enough, I got to speak up. And I, and I really don't want to talk about it much more, but it's just, yeah. I, everybody's offended on this side of the coin, right? Well, I mean, I mean, just from, from what you're saying, it sounds like um, he waited until, um, till George and Muhammad couldn't, um, Articulate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, so well, it, so he know, could say anything he wanted in a way, you know. He said he was going to sue us. We told him to go ahead, but you know what? He can't because he has to prove himself then. And he can't. Yeah. There's not no one out there that disclosure's a bitch, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> the whole boxing world knows he's lying. Anyway, listen, listen. Oh. In, in the in the end, it's sad. I just. I, I, I don't yeah. like it. I don't like uh, it, it's. It leaves me with a bad taste in my mouth. It's just in the end, it's really? sad. You Mitch know, was cur- Mitch, Mitch just walked, called him up, said, Spider, can we cut this down a little bit? And he just went off on Mitch, saying he wasn't going to, you don't know, you weren't there. So I think he yeah. really believes the story now in his head. Well, we, well yeah, the thought that maybe he's going through some kind of crisis that way has, has you know, gone through my head, right? So I feel for the guy that way, but, you know. That's a good way to look at it. I mean, w- when you deal with someone like hangers-ons, you know what I mean? People that, like, w- want to... Um, uh, you know, like what, what, they're basically uh, trolling for clout. Uh, you, know, you know what I mean? To make themselves feel good and look good. But it's under such a false pretense that I think that is a good move to just kind of feel sorry for him. But I would be like, I would be pretty outspoken. <laughs> yeah, well. I would, I, I would create like 
videos and rap songs about him. Like I would go nuts. You know? <laughs> hey, that's funny you say that because there is an actual rapper called Spider Jones. Not really. Yeah, there is. Spider Jones. <laughs> that's so funny. James. I didn't even listen. I'm a hip hop head, and I didn't know that there was a Spider Jones. Yeah, I, like, I don't think. I think he's big in Nantucket or somewhere. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, there's a lot of things that rhyme with Rant Nantucket. That's why. <laughs> that's, you know, a lot of rappers there. I think. Um. I was trying to think if I had any boxing memories, not to make it about me, and I only really have one. Um, and it was the time I was in Miami, and um, I was talking to uh, Lennox Lewis. I was throwing a, cl a club event at a place called Dolce, and uh, I saw Lennox Lewis outside, and I, I, I tripped him out because I walked up to him, and I was like, Kitchener. And he looked at me, he's like, what? <laughs> you trained in Kitchener, Ontario. And he's like, how the fuck do you know about Kitchener? I'm like, ah, I'm from Toronto. Yeah, <laughs> we just started talking. And then all of a sudden, this guy comes out and like shoulders Lennox Lewis and just keeps walking. And Lennox Lewis is like, what the fuck? And it was Busta Rhymes. And, and Busta, the rapper. And Busta Rhymes like, like shoulders Lennox Lewis, probably didn't know it was him, and then walked down these steps just as this guy like smacked this girl across the face, which was awful, but good thing Buster Rhymes was there because he just fed this guy like five punches and then a car rolled up at the fifth punch and Buster Rhymes goes in and the car drives away and me and Lennox Lewis just look at each other and we're just like, like it all happened in like 18 seconds. Shoulder bump, walked on the stairs, five punches, cars pulls up, he goes. And we were just like, this is crazy. So that's the only boxing story that, that I have. But, um, and then the only picture that I have that's close to boxing is when Furio threatened to kill me at a, an event in New Jersey. From this, but, but that's about it. Um, I'm gonna well, go actually, over these there's a video. There's yeah. a video on YouTube where Lennox is at a fight, and after the fight, he's being interviewed, and a guy walks up to him uh, and puts his fist up to Lennox's face. And you see Lennox throw him back. Yeah, good. <laughs> good. Um, do Do you guys know the Canadian boxers personally, and do you know them well? And and are you guys friends? Like Lennox Lewis, I used to love Razor Ruddock. I thought Razor Ruddock was going to be going somewhere, and you know he gave Tyson a run. Both both. George those trained Razor Ruddock. Did he really? Oh, no, sorry for the motorcycle boys. Sorry. Oh, that's okay. Um, it makes you yeah, seem more ahead, authentic. Tommy, go ahead. It's all good. I was saying about George training Razor Ruddock. Yeah, George got Razor's first big win. Uh, over really? uh, wh wh who was it? Bone Crusher Smith? No, who was no, it? No, um, Mike Weaver. Mike, Mike Weaver. Weaver. Mike Weaver. Yeah. So uh, my dad said he was a phenomenal athlete. Phenomenal athlete. Yeah. Um, didn't. But Lennox Lewis. Yeah, we speak, to, we speak to Lennox Lewis. We speak to all the kids. But we speak to everyone. We speak to like we said. Larry Holmes has calls me up. Larry's wife calls me up. Muhammad Ali's daughters and his two wives call me up. We've mm. seen them over the last few years. Uh, Mike Tyson, like I said, came in to see George. Yeah. Are you boxing. expecting? Sort, sorry, go, go ahead, Mitch. No, just the boxing community is as rough as it is, as it is, does have a lot of good people in it, too. So that's the. You yeah, know. I was going to say that it seems like a family. Like, uh, there's, there's certain things like that. Like, there's. Um, boxing's like that wrestling is sort of like that i know that sounds weird but like where it's almost like a big family and 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 you know there's like so much respect for people who respect the sport yes um and all these fighters i've always i've always listened to these fighters talk when their career's over and they all seem to have this like massive archive of classic fights from like the 50s to like now yeah. like mike tyson apparently um when he was trained being trained when he was like 17 had access to like all of his trainer i forget his name right now but all Custom of his trainers are cut yes Custom 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 Custom. Yeah. and 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 basically learned by watching all of the greats from like the 40s until the 80s and, mike and knows it seems invaluable boxing. there's nothing you can't catch mike he knows everything about boxing yeah what's it like like i mean he seems like he like bought like retirement has been really good for his mental state but what is he like a nice guy. He's never treated us bad. When he sees George, he bows down to George. He walks with George, holding George. Uh, we, Like I said, he was here two years ago. Uh, his one-man show. He has that one-man show. Oh, he, that was great. That was great. Directed by Spike Lee. Yeah. yeah, he invited us all to it. Uh, and during the show, he stopped the show to say that George Chavala was here. I had George up at the front of the stage. He shook George's hand. After it, he brought us in the back room. Uh, 
George, I had to wheel him in a wheelchair at that time to get him through the crowd. And yeah. Mike took him out of the wheelchair, put him in the chair next to him. It was Mike looks at me and goes, This guy, 97 fights. Can you believe? Never knocked down, never knocked out. Well, he got two knockouts, I think, wasn't he? Knocked out twice? George? Technical. Yeah, was that in his technical. amateur? Technical. No, technical. technical. He never oh, TK. So a technical yeah. knockout means you, you didn't touch the canvas. The referee stopped the fight either because I uh, thought you were absorbing too much punishment or there was a severe injury, bleeding can't be stopped, something like that. So the Joe okay. Frazier fight, they stopped that fight. Yeah. George went into that fight with an eye injury. Oh. Frazier admits himself. There's a video out there. Frazier admits it. He says he knew George had the injury and he kept jabbing to the eye. They knew he's going to stop yeah. the fight. Ended up. George had to have all reconstructive surgery on his face after that. Wow. So they um, stopped that fight. So that's called a technical knockout. Hey, hey, Tommy, you know what Georgie always told me about that? They put a piece of plastic silicone. Silicone. Uh, under oh, his, wow. to support the, the bottom yeah. of the eye, eye socket, right? Yeah. Uh, keep um, the eye in place. So he always said he imagines himself if when he gets buried and the body starts to rot away, <laughs> and there'll be this little, this will be this little clunk as, as the piece of plastic hits the bottom of his skull. <laughs> That's crazy. Um, there was a rumor. And, and I don't know, like, listen, I'm not a boxing expert. I really, I, I grew up, I'm 45, so I grew up in the Tyson era. And I watched any Tyson fight I could find because I just, I was like, this is fucking crazy. That guy's, that guy's a killer. And it was enter, most, the most entertaining, I think. Like, you, you guys remember, in the late 80s, early 90s, I felt, we felt, I felt spoiled. We had, like, Michael Jordan. We had Mike Tyson. We would soon get Tiger Woods. There was all these great players and everything. Um, and, and athletes. I just, I'm just wondering though. I heard a rumor. Did St was Stallone's character Rocky partially, at least, inspired by George? Is is that like something you've heard before? Well, so I was at the Hall of Fame when Stallone was there. He went up. He went up to George, kissed George on the cheek, and said, "You're my idol." Now, wow. If you go back to Rocky one, where uh, Stallone he brings Adrian on a date, and they're actually skating around the rink but Rocky's running. She says, what do you do for a living? He pulls out his wallet. He shows a picture. He says, that's me fighting whoever. It's actually George in that picture. Fighting the, fighting the Italian heavyweight champion, Dante Kanye, 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 Kanye. And that's in the wallet, that picture. Really? Yeah. That is like the greatest Rocky trivia I've ever heard of. If you if you like movies, I got another one for you. Please do. Yes. He, he's also you in. You guys are educating um, me. I love it. Go ahead. He's also in uh, with Tarantino's movie Pulp Fiction. Pulp Fiction. George, George is in it. Yeah. So uh, a picture of George. Uh, you remember when uh, the character um, it was a fighter? What's the actor's name? Of course, Bruce Willis. Bruce Willis goes back to get the watch. It was brought back yeah. to Vietnam. It was on the trunk of the elephant. That's right. Yeah, and <laughs> and, and he has to get that watch because he's maniacal about it. He goes back and he goes into it because he was supposed to throw the fight, but instead he knocked the knocked the guy out instead because he yeah. had too much pride. And now they want to kill him. So he's going back to get his watch before he leaves town. And waiting for him in the um, toilet is John Travolta. But Travolta. Yeah. So so just as you enter it, as Bruce Willis enters the apartment. On the wall, it's a big poster of George. It's George Chevalo, Canadian heavyweight champion. So, yeah. He, wow. Yeah, yeah. Well, George, he, George, has been, George has been in about 20 movies. The Fly. Are you talking about pictures or, or pictures of no, him or him? We're talking in The Fly. The both, movie, both, the fly he's he's had some acting stars. Yeah. Yeah, the Cronenberg uh, What's the guy's name for The Fly? Oh, I forget. But the guy, the guy, I know who you mean. The guy yes, from uh, uh, Goldblum, Jeff, Goldblum. Jeff Goldblum. Goldblum. Yeah, yeah that's George right. arm wrestles him in the fly and he breaks George's arm off. Well, that prom would night, never happen. <laughs> prom night three, George is a school teacher in that. And like, these are little parts that you see. If you prom Google these, three. you'll see them. I yeah. can't believe I missed one and two. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> yeah, I know I can. The, um, the, the last few movies, uh, Creed. With the loan that he's produced. Oh, okay. And so I'm just gonna really quick, both those movies. Yeah, go ahead, please. When they go by quick, there's posters of George on the wall in the gym. Okay. Yeah. So, See, I love uh, this. Sorry. Go ahead. 
No, I, I just keep on interrupting. I should just shut the fuck up. Go ahead, Mitch. No, 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 no. I was, I was saying something. Told us to go ahead with the oh, show. Oh, so, yeah. so, so, yeah. It's, it's been reputed that uh, Stallone based um, the character on George is all. They've also said Joe Frazier. They also said um, was Wepner. Chuck Wepner. Yeah, they've, you know. So it, it's become like it's such like you know urban mythology about who it's based on. It's probably an amalgam of a whole bunch of different people. I mean, if you watch the way he talks, and no one talks about this, there was a there was a fighter from New York City, a middleweight called Rocky Rocky Graziano, and he always talked like this, like a real yeah, you know, like that's the way he talked, and that's like that's like Rocky uh, Rocky Balboa and Rocky Graziano verbatim, like it's it's the same thing, right? So no one talks about that, and and Joe Frazier worked in a meat packing plant, so you see Stallone goes to the meat packing plant. To hit that yeah. Joe Frazier work, was famously worked in a meat packing plant. The the fight on very short notice, if you remember, it was Rocky yeah. was a fill in. That's the same thing as my dad with his first fight. So so there are there are tons of parallels. Hey Mitch, right? then there's the Burt Cooper Burt Young story. The Burt Young story. Yeah, remember uh, George. Do I have Strangle? to Google Burt Young? Who the fuck is oh, Burt Young? I'm, so Burt Young, I'm Young too young. Very good, Tom. <laughs> Tommy, you are good, brother. Um, the, the Rocky movie where. Uh, his uh, brother-in-law, Holly. Yeah, Walt, Holly. He's Burt Young. Mitch, tell the story. Oh. So, yeah, so yeah. my dad uh, sent out word for sparring partners, like in the late '60s and early '70s. He was looking for some sparring partners. So various people would show up. Some guys would have a reputation. Some guys would just be like, like they they had no business being in a boxing gym, right? So one guy comes up. Uh, uh, my dad thought he was Puerto Rican, um, and he starts talking and. Right away, my dad notices he's too small, but he's, you know, he's kind of interested in why the, the guy this small want to come up and spar with George, right? So uh, my dad talks to him, yeah, let's go on, uh, have some lunch. And my dad broke the news to him, listen, pal, you're, you're a little too small. Like, But my dad liked talking to people, where are you from? I'm from New York, what do you do? Well, I want to be an actor. And um, years later, he said, an actor, he always remembered the guy wanted to be an actor. Years later, my dad was in the Chicago airport and Burt Young, now famous in the Rocky movies, comes up and says, hey, George, do you remember me? And my dad said, I said, yeah, but I lied. I really didn't. I right? say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the guy said to him, I always hold you here, like top left, like over the heart. My dad uh. said to himself, yeah, yeah, that's great. He said to himself, like, that's a pretty intimate thing to say, right? You know, yeah. you're just, uh, just in the middle of the Chicago airport. And then... And then he reverse engineered his memory and he got it. And it all came back into place. And yeah, that's the guy. He wanted to be a fighter. <laughs> he was like four foot ten, wasn't he? Oh, he's not a big guy. Yeah, oh, yeah. 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 But my like I'm five said, six, my and I would was... probably look down on Polly Walnuts or whatever. No, not Walnuts, Polly. Uh, Burt Young. Burt Young. Whatever. Yeah. whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's a lot of connections to that movie, actually. That's really interesting. Like, it's like, but I mean, if the picture's in the wallet, I'm pretty sure Rocky's your dad. <laughs> you know. Hey, you know what George said when he heard about it? What's that? What did he say? Am I going to get some royalties out of this? <laughs> <laughs> they did use his likeness in a big Hollywood blockbuster for a oh, moment. Apparently, there was a there was an old it was it was property of the Toronto Telegram, an old newspaper, a forerunner of the Toronto Sun. So um, Stallone had bought all the rights. He bought all the rights for like a, a paltry sum of like 500 bucks, right? So they couldn't come after him for it because he wanted it so badly in there, right? So they can, you know, use, they, George, they, they, they can use George's picture or whatever on the wall as long as it doesn't have his name on it. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. You'd think that they would just like throw the guy a bone though. Like Quentin Tarantino, how about you give George Chavallo well, that's what I felt like saying. That, that's what yeah. I felt like saying this to Stallone at the Hall of Fame. Throw him a million bucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, hey, 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 listen, listen. I, I, I'm going to play the artist here, and I'm going to tell you guys. Well, that stuff's all cool. What I really love that people send me from all over Toronto, the GTA, uh, pictures of my dad, like street art, like spray painted his name somewhere. He's everywhere. Like way up high over, like you know, a trestle, a train trestle. We'll see. Like it's really yeah. beautiful stuff. I really love that stuff because that's like, that's like really embedded into the into the country and the city i love that stuff the, the flashy has stuff's anyone, good too has anyone ever approached you um 
uh, to like or approach your dad um, about doing like a biopic, like a movie about him? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Many people have. Yeah, sure. And and did it, were there any close like oh we almost cut a deal here or was it always just like nah? Well, how best to put this? Anytime someone's come up to me with an idea, mm-hmm. it, it just it just it just oh, oh I'm not gonna bullshit it reeks it reeks of cliche. You know, it just, it just, yeah, the champ comes out at the end. And, and um, the way I look back on my life and, you know, Tommy's been around my dad and, and seen all the craziness that ensued later on in life. When, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's complicated stuff and it takes a complicated mindset to kind of try to put it into some kind of format that people are going to find interesting and enjoy, right? Because there's, there's a lot of hardship there, right? And how deep do you want to go into it? But, you yeah, know. Yeah, that's a tough one. You know. Yeah, it's like, you know, like I've often thought about it, but I often thought, you know, if I was involved in something like that, it might damn near kill mm. me, you know, psychologically, right? So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it would be very, you know, it'd be very delicate to do it. But um, if you ever and, did do it. Um, and, my, and, and, and my sister, and my sister too. I have a surviving sister, my sister Vanessa. That's right. Right, and, and you never did do it though, and 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 you show George as a as a uh, like a twenty year old. If he ever opens his wallet, you could put Stallone's picture in that wallet. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Fair is fair, motherfuckers. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's a good um, idea. Are you ex- are you um? I I have all these questions that are like I I I I don't want to ask because I don't want to sound like um someone who's 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 being disrespectful but um i, I i'm gonna try to ask in a way just just know that i don't mean it disrespectfully are you um anticipating that uh, um you know whenever he he happens to pass because it's one thing i know about dementia often the family members are like almost relieved when they when they pass because of the because they're not familiar anymore they don't really know what's going on and they don't want them to be suffering because they can't communicate if they are and all that kind of stuff but do you anticipate having a big reception and funeral where all these personalities from the boxing world converge into Mississauga or Toronto, wherever you guys are. And, and, you know, in celebrating his life. I think the city alone is going to do that. Of course. Of course. George. Yeah, of course. George is, George is bigger than life and his, and his, and his final piece is going to be bigger than life. Right. It's going to be crazy. It's going to be nuts. Yeah. Sorry, Tommy. I cut um, you off. No, guys, I'm, yeah, I'm going to go inside. My battery's running low. I'm going to go inside and reconnect. Okay. I think yep. the city alone is going to do something like that. Is it Miss? Is it Toronto or Mississauga? Or what city? Where, where is he from? Uh, Toronto. Toronto. Okay. The junction. The junction is where George grew up. That was a rough area back in the day. Well, yeah. Even uh, Ty Dolly's the junction from floor. there too. Yeah. I have a good story, but I can't. Only story that people have they they call it <laughs> I have one of those. yeah exactly <laughs> yeah, yeah i would love to share my ty domi ty, story but ty, i don't want him to kill me yeah ty domi and mark Wahlberg actually together they were together one night and sent me a video for george for his birthday oh really george's, that was george yeah george's birthday they both were at a hotel together and they put uh, did a video and sent it to me to give to george was, was that a rasta phil connection is that way Mark no, um, no, no, no. I knew Ty. I know Ty just from events and things like that. Yeah. And uh, he he sent me a he sent me a message. He goes, "Is it a George's birthday tomorrow?" I said, "Yeah." He goes, "I got something for you guys." He sent us the video with him and Mark. Oh wow! Yeah, it, yeah. It's one of those things. Um, you know, is I feel like there should be like a like a Chevalo. Is there? Is there? Does did George ever do like a? a a gym? Like, was there ever a Chevalo gym? No. Um, no. George, if you think of George, George is known for the Lansdowne Boxing Club, Sully's Boxing Gym. Yeah. Uh, places like that. And, but yeah, no, he's my, never gonna... no, let's listen in the gym business. And I've been around the gym business all my yeah. life. To be to be successful at it, you got to be there 24 7. And George could never commit to George, <laughs> Hey, Tom, you, have no to always, you have to always wear track pants and you have to like dump yeah, yeah, spit yeah. buckets out and shit. Yeah, yeah, be... yeah, no, none for me, thanks. You, you always yeah. want to be going out deep, right, Tom? 
George would call me for breakfast. We'd be driving home. And he'd say, "Champ, it's almost noon. Let's have lunch." <laughs> Oh, yeah. And you, you guys have had some fabulous meals, too. Oh, yeah. I've stayed in the best hotels, had the best dinners. You wouldn't believe because of George. I, now, I'm, I'm just curious about this because he's he really tough. Um, did he ever get into, like, fights not in the ring? Like, where he had to take care of somebody because they were being disrespectful or, like, doing something like that? Look at Tom's well, face. Tom, Tom's <laughs> like, I don't know if I can talk about this. Yet. I, Statue of limitations is what? Him. I've heard stories. I've never seen it personally. I've seen them, things where it was going to happen, and I just had to calm things down a little bit just so. Yeah. Okay. You always get those one guy, you know, the guy that's drunk and says, I heard, I heard just a punching bag. And it's like, uh-oh. Uh, <laughs> okay, uh, your teeth are on the ground. Look at that. that yeah. crazy? Yeah. <laughs> Here's a funny story, a little bit of Canadian uh, Toronto sports history. Do um, you remember Eddie Shack, the guy who used to play for the... Oh, yeah, this is a good story. Right, Dude, I so, bought a Christmas tree from Eddie Shack one year. Is that That's right? Right? A Christmas there tree. Go. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. And he also had, in the 70s, he had this thing called the Pop Shop. It was kind of like wholesale. You'd go, you'd oh, pick yeah, right. bottles back and forth. you get them refilled. It was like, it was like you know, uh, the bottles, that's the first kind of recycling of the bottles in the in the pop industry in Canada. And so I think he even on a coffee, Eddie Shack donuts or something. Or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so... Um, Apparently, they wanted to do a deal with my dad and Shaq for the pop shop. But Shaq said, no, nah, just give it to me. Don't give it to Shivalo. So once my dad heard about that, <laughs> he, saw him at, he saw him at a boxing, uh, no, some kind of sports dinner. And he shook hands with him. And then he just, he just pulled his arm and gave him a little tap in the liver. <laughs> and yeah. apparently, apparently, Eddie's eyes bugged out like with six inches. And, and he was it was on a light. Gordy Howe dinner. It was on a go. Gordy Howe dinner. Tommy it knows. happened. And you'd hit Eddie Shack. If you're going to hit Eddie Shack, that's where you're going to hit him because he liked to, you know. Yeah, oh, yeah, right in the liver. He said he, he yeah. went purple. He went absolutely purple. And George goes, I did, Dad, you can't go hitting people. He goes, it was only a little shot, just a little thing. <laughs> <laughs> and Eddie oh, Shack was a tough guy, wasn't he, back in the day? Like, he was a oh, tough yeah, hockey yeah. player. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean I, I'm sure on the blades he was a tough guy. But, you know, you're talking about a world-class fighter, you know, hitting someone yeah. who's never really, you know, not learned how to punch at all, right? It's different. It's different. Would you would you say that he was mild mannered, humble? Because um, I I have a hard time gauging what he might have been like. Like, um, say in his forties and fifties, like you know, walking around in restaurants and stuff like that. It, it feels like, and maybe I'm totally wrong about this, but my gut says that he was kind of like mild mannered and polite. Oh yeah, when it, when I was yeah, mild mannered and polite, but but uh, like all you know, violent sport athletes, you know, he he could he could turn on a dime. Right. You know, if he, if he perceived, you know, something was awry and it would, and there was a physical threat of any kind, uh, you just see you just see a different a different uh, person psychologically. They can they can go to places and turn turn the switch on with such power that, you know, you know, 99 percent of the people who even would be stupid enough to venture, like getting into a, a confrontation with the guy would just be blown away by that energy just getting coiling. Just it's just coiling, yeah, and, and then you don't want to see it unleash because there's nothing like seeing a professional fighter hit someone who, who doesn't know what they're doing. It's like yeah. lamb to slaughter. I was, yeah. I, was, I was going to the gym with George up till he was like 76 years old, 77. He was going to the gym two times a day, and all these guys in the gym would just stand there and watch him and watch the power that this guy had in lifting weights and things like that. I'm talking bodybuilders, regular guys. They were all just standing there and just watching George lift these weights like nothing. And they were having a hard struggle with it. It was They would shake their heads. And he was 76 at the time. Really? How old yeah. is he now? 84? Yeah, he'll be 85 in September. And he was accessible, right? He was one of those like well-known athletes that wasn't like you know afraid to mill about with the public, wasn't he? No, I no, I think my dad was. You know, he came from pretty lower middle class roots, right? He always, you know, he always, you know, he loved all people from all walks of life, right? My dad, and that's that's why I think my dad is will always be like commemorated as a as someone all of Canada can kind of get behind because you know, didn't matter social class, race, gender, wherever you are on that spectrum. Yeah, it, it, Georgie was good. 
fan, you know, he loved everybody. He, and, he, and he had an open heart for everybody, right? Unless, unless you want to just, fight him in the ring. <laughs> Aside from that. Which is something I would never do, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> um, I, just, I just got a, uh, a text um, from somebody who says that they're watching. And, um, and he wants you guys to know that um, every time he met George, he was a gentleman and he was a true gent. And uh, that's Mike Bullard. So Mike Bullard is uh, sending oh, his... Uh, yeah. Mike, I don't know, Mike. Mike. Hi, Mike. Yeah? Say hello to Mike. Okay. Mike's a great guy. I will. I will. He's, there. He's, he's on the comeback trail right now. He's in Ottawa working uh, at a gig. So, um, yeah. So that's... Uh, he interviewed I, him, he I, said, I think twice on his show back in the day. We just yeah. ran into Mike, well, no, a couple of years ago, I ran into Mike. I was with George. We ran into Mike at Harbor 60. Oh, really? Were yeah. you guys like, you guys are like doppelgangers now that I'm looking at you. You guys are, <laughs> <laughs> you look similar. <laughs> you really do. <laughs> How do you tell each other apart? You guys, <laughs> did you ever fill in for Mike on open mic? Because I think you. <laughs> That's good. That's good. So yeah, what yeah, do you do? You're, you're a teacher and a wrestling coach now, Mitch. Is that right? I am. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, well, with, with uh, the COVID pandemic, I haven't had a, an opportunity to enjoy my, my coaching passion, which is wrestling, which I absolutely love. It's, it's like boxing smarter cousin, right? So that's what I say. Um, yeah. And, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm soon – I think i got about another year left in me, James, and, and, yeah. uh, um, and that'll be it for me with the teaching. I'm, I'm ready to retire and relax, yeah. And Tom, you're a. Are you still working security for like big names and all that? Yeah, I still do all that. Um, I do all kinds of security, but a lot of uh, over the years, a lot of celebrity stuff. But have you ever let someone beat up a celebrity you didn't like? <laughs> <laughs> no, or I wouldn't have a job. <laughs> That's true. That's true. There were seven guys. I swear, it was like. <laughs> Just give yourself a black eye just for uh, <clears throat> did you but um are you one of the ones that would drive like the big suvs or are you I'm like on, i've done that i've done that and uh i've actually picked up guys at their hotels i've walked with guys through at tiff at red carpet i've done it all so well, I'm, i think uh i used to get kicked out by guys like you from the tiff opening gala because <laughs> i used to uh I, when i was in my early 20s um i had this great scam where i used to I used to find the TIFF core sponsors and it would be like Ford or something. And then I would go to a buddy's house and I would create business cards of the vice president of Ford Motor. And then I would go to the event really early and I would just give them my card and they'd be like, oh, welcome, Mr. Johnson. And they'd give me my <laughs> lanyard and I would like and I would roam around. And um, and one time uh, <laughs> I was talking to this guy and, and I couldn't quite read him because he was like, yeah, how you doing? And I'm like, oh, I'm good. How are you? He's like, how's it going at Ford? And I had all these lines set up. He's like, I'm Mr. Johnson. And I'm like, fuck. <laughs> so I had to give him his lanyard back and everything. It was just one of those things. And then a guy like you was just like, come on. And they knew me by name because I used to, I used to sneak into all these events. Um, but yeah, people I also... Always, like, people used to always ask me, are you George Chevallo's bodyguard? George's only a bodyguard. I asked you that. Yeah, you asked me that too. People used to say, I worked with Mike Tyson. They'd say, are you Mike Tyson's but you know what? It's not about that. These guys, you just want to get them in their event and out of their event safe. That's all. Well, yeah, you know yeah, yeah, one, yeah. Guy, yeah. one guy that's had one too many and he's going to say something or want to do something. Yeah. Just, just, I uh, just want to say about Tommy and his relationship with my dad. You know, there were times in my dad's life when he really needed somebody like Tommy and Tommy was there for him. He's, he's, he was George's friend and he's become a family friend. And he's a good man. He's always done the right thing by my father. So, and, and, you know, my dad definitely benefited from, from his friendship over the years too. So uh, good on you, Tom. I always, always, I just want everybody to know that out loud. Thank you. Yeah. I, listen, I, I think, um, I, I think I can, I, at, at this point in my life, you know, my, my job is to talk to people and to sort of size them up and to sort of try to use my instincts about them and everything. And, um, and just talking to you guys for this hour, you, you seem like really like salt of the earth, genuine, authentic people. And, um, and uh, I, I think that what you guys are going through right now, where, uh, where your dad and your friend is, um, is sort of like reaching that end or whatever, I think that, um, you know, the stories that you guys tell will, will keep his memory alive in such a way that, um, you know, I think that, I think you guys are part of the legacy, you know, and I, and I think you should be, be proud of each other for that because um, I'm sitting here listening to you guys talk and, 
And um, I've had guests before where I've cut the interview short because I'm like, this guy's kind of a douchebag. <laughs> you know, like I, I haven't had any moment like that with you guys at all. In fact, it's the entire opposite. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I find myself uh, it, like if there was a douchebag in this conversation, it's probably me. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Hey, actually, but, this week, mm. this week is the week uh, Muhammad Ali actually died. I think today was his would have been his funeral. Oh, um, really? George was actually asked to be one of the pallbearers at his funeral. Wow. They were always and, kept and, in touch. George always attended all Muhammad's functions, his, his birthdays. The same Muhammad always came to George. They never lost contact. That's why we still talk to Muhammad's family now, up till today. Yeah. True enough. That's great. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. The relationships that you can forge through, uh, you know, um, through, uh, through your dad and through your friend, um, if those can last, that's another mechanism for making a memory of a person last and a legacy. So I think that all of the things that I'm hearing today, and I'm learning a lot too, because, um, you know, um, unfortunately, well, people I'll remember- have to do a part two, because we have another two hours to go. <laughs> well, listen, not only, do I, not only do I want to do a part two, but it would be, uh, it would be fun to, to sort of like have people pop in and out with George yeah, Stewart, just for like 10, yeah, 15 be... minutes. Um, you know, like you guys will get me like what Mike Tyson and all these guys. No, no, That's sorry. right. <laughs> <laughs> but it would be, but but you know what I would do? I would do like, um, you know, I I would do a show like that, like where where it's it's just basically a like a not a memorial because he's still with us, right? But like just a tribute, like a tribute show, um, with with fighters that he's fought or whoever, right? Like like I mean, I'm not picky, but um, I want to learn more about your dad. I I you know I I want to I want to learn more than what people know things that people know which i think is important and i think obviously but but i, I you know i i want to i just want to to learn more about him from people that knew him like you guys or what he was like in the ring those are the kind of stories that i think you know um i think we're missing that from from our icons you know what i mean like every time i think of wayne gretzky now i just think of his daughter's half naked photos on twitter and i don't want <laughs> i want to remember the hockey player and i'm just like oh fuck. <laughs> you know you know what? I'm sure I, I, never knew, yeah. I never knew how big George was until I started traveling to the States with him. And he had lineups of people waiting to see him. The Hall of Fames, the WBC conventions, they were all there to yeah. see him. We'd get off, we'd pull into the hotel, and the cameras would just come out. Look, there's George Chabalo. That's awesome. When I uh, maybe we'll finish with this story. Um, yeah. I, I knew my dad was a famous Canadian when I was a kid. Um, in 1974, I went to Puerto Rico with my dad and my brother and um, a couple of other people. Um, my dad was going to uh, comment on the fight for CBC. Clyde Gray was fighting Angel Espada, a Puerto Rican fighter at San Juan for the welterweight championship of the world. And uh, I've never been in a more boxing mad, rabid environment in my life. And um, it was like, 20,000 people, no lights on, one singular light in the in the ring. And they start introducing like fighters in the crowd, people there, right? Everybody who's there, all the luminaries, all the ex-champions, whatever. And then they mention my dad in Spanish, Boxeador de Canada, Campeón de Canada, like George Chavala. And my dad got, my brother and I just, what? what? Like what? We're like 8,000 miles from home and it's like my dad's getting an ovation that which is they rock the place I always remember that so you know yeah George, what was George it about was, him was like that, that is a good story to end on but unfortunately I'll spoil it because I want to know okay. good, if good. you can like if you can sort of like um quantify what it was about him like he he wasn't um he wasn't a world champion and he seemed to be treated as if he was well, well he, why yeah, was that? Well, he's the world champion of like durability, resilience, that old school tough guyness that you know um, people might call it toxic masculinity. But I, you know, there are parts about being like just tough as nails that can serve you, right? So yeah, uh, right. Uh, and, and I think people recognize that in George, and all throughout the world. I mean, he's he's regarded as having. In one of the most being most, one of the most durable and having the best chins in boxing hardest head would actually be a better description perhaps 
in so many that, ways. In, in a few ways, right? Yeah, in a few ways. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so yeah, people identify with that. And even even back then, after when he was at the end of his boxing career, my brother and I were just said, wow. Like, like, and then, you know, people would kind of look over at you and point to you a little bit. Oh, that's his kids. <laughs> and then, and then you, you get very quiet once the fight starts because if you start rooting for the other guy, they start throwing things at you, <laughs> and some yeah, of them are rather right. hard. <laughs> yeah, you're not fr you're friends, but then you're not friends, right? <laughs> the way it works. It's well, listen, um, I would love to have you guys back. I would love to do a show where we bring people, pop people in and out. Anyone you guys want. I'm not gonna, you know, not gonna lie. I don't know anyone <laughs> in the boxing world really, except except you guys, which is a good start, I think. Um, but that would be great to talk to you guys again. Um, I feel like we could do another two hours. And so um, let's try to have you back maybe next month or something and just see if you guys aren't busy. And if you guys want to like, you know, we'll, 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 we'll bring Bullard in maybe to talk. Cause yeah, I know he's got idea. a bunch yeah, of memories. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, but, uh, but is there anything that you wanted to cover that we haven't covered or anything you want to say before we go or. Tom, you go. You want to thank me at least? No, I'm kidding. I'm oh, I'll thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me <laughs> on just the show. Like... No one's ever thanked me. Why would anyone thank me? <laughs> I, just, no, no. I thank you. I think I think you guys uh, were great guests, and um, I'm gonna have you back. And 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 thank you for taking the time. I and Tom, thank you for reaching out in the first place. I appreciate it. No that. problem. Hey, nice okay, to see guys. You. Nice to meet you on this format, James. Take nice care. to meet you guys as well. That's Mitch Chavallo, everyone, and Tom Doyle. And thank you guys for coming. I appreciate thank that. Thank you. Um, we. This is. That was a special episode for me. I, I Tom reached out to me uh, a couple days ago and and said, you know, hey, would you like me to come on with Mitch Chavallo? And and immediately I said yes. Um, the, it can't be overstated how um, impactful uh, George was on people. Not only was he exactly what Tom and Mitch were talking about as far as being a champion. Um, it might not have been an actual champion with a belt, but he was a champion as far as the people were concerned because he would not go down. He was uh, a fighter to the end, uh, when he was a boxer in the sense that like, you just could not knock the man down. And then life has started to happen to him. And and those must have been the toughest fights, obviously, of his life. Again, his, you know, three kids and his wife all, all passing away very tragically. And, um, you know, that's like a, a, a fighting 10 Muhammad Ali's. And, uh, and, and still, there was a perseverance about him. And uh, he, he's like one of the greatest Canadians. He, he's an icon. I can't wait to have them back. So I thank them again, uh, Mitch Chavallo and Tom Doyle, for coming on the show. Um, we have uh, a bunch of things that, that are happening in the next uh, four or five days. Uh, I'm pretty close to getting Ilya Ponomarenko, the, uh, the guest that I've had once before, the war correspondent, Ukraine's main and most popular war correspondent back on the show. That was a big show last time. We have Simon Rakoff that's coming on. He's a comic. He's a Canadian comic. And then next week uh, on Thursday or Friday, we haven't nailed it down yet, uh, Adam Scorgi, the brilliant documentary producer is going to be on to talk about uh culture high and we're going to screen uh his documentary about weed and snoop dogs in that movie um fuck, there's a whole bunch of people in that movie well anyways adam will be here and we'll be doing the same thing that we did with rerun shit uh you know stopping the movie here and there and talking uh and, and adam will will take the reins talking about the behind the scenes stuff and we actually have something in common that we discovered on the phone the other day when I told him that uh, I was hired by the Liberal Party in 2011 from September to January to lobby liberal delegates for their federal convention in January in Ottawa to vote yes on a policy initiative of legalization of marijuana. And when I started that endeavor, it was at, uh, I think it was 30% of liberals wanted to legalize, 70% did not. And by the time I was done and we went to the convention, it was like, I think it was 78, 22. So I did my job, they paid me, whatever. So I'm, I'm not taking credit for legalization, but I was one of the mechanisms, uh, one of the cogs of legalization before it started. And when I, when I talked to Adam about that, uh, we had a lot in common because uh, the same MPs, some of them um, were, were saying, we don't want legalization. We're then inviting him to screen his film in Ottawa. Uh, and they would invite different people from different political parties. So that's going to be amazing. And, and you know, that the, the, the We Run Shit episode was like a beta testing. 
And now we're in the big leagues because he's a much better filmmaker <laughs> than I am. Um, my film happened by accident, and he does his on purpose, which is probably um, the main reason why he's a better filmmaker than I am. So stay tuned for that. Uh, and by the way, I, I need to, to shout out everybody in the chat. Uh, Jen, DaCosta, Rihanna, um, Justin. Uh, I'm going to forget a whole bunch of people. Melissa. Uh, la, 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 la. I'm, I'm scrolling. Uh, Leanne, I don't see you there, but you're there. Anyways, if I forgot you, doesn't mean anything. Um, you guys have like taken my podcast, which was ranked uh, 230th about a month ago and uh i'm number 15 somehow with this shitty camera with my kids yelling <laughs> in the background um we are we're we're killing it and uh you know as much as i would like to take credit for that um i think i'm so thankful that i have uh these regular viewers i appreciate you guys more than you know um you know i consider many of you ladies part of my harem and um and I think you're okay with that. <laughs> so thank you. Um, no, but for real, you guys, uh, you guys are sort of like the straw that stirs the drink. And I appreciate that. So I love you guys. Thank you so much. And uh, we will see you next time on Black Bolt. So thank you. Black Bolt. Black, 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 black,